Been here once before. Nice to meet you. you. Good. How are you? Pleasure to meet you, sir. Welcome to MCC. Thank you. Been here once before. Nice to meet you? you. Good. How are you? Pleasure to meet you, sir. Welcome to MCC. Thank you. Bonjour. Bonjour Thomas. Hello Thomas. Uh, we cannot let our tools uh, escape, for example, or the microphone escape. Otherwise, we'll find it in a very people at the control center who follow this. There's a tremendous database that we Bonjour, Thomas. Hello, Thomas. Um, how if a tool So we run on a we run on a wall like this, not here in Columbus, but uh, in a, in another module. We have a and let's enlist the help of a friend, Patsy. You might know her. Specifically, how HoloLens can turn every room of your house into a personalized video game level. But today, we want to take mixed reality one step further. So we've got something new to show you. Holograms you can hold. They're wearing augmented uh, contact lenses so that they can interact with these 3D objects. Now, in this scene, the guy on the left in the green shirt, he thinks he sees an object in 3D space that's being broadcast to him. So he grabs it and he puts it off to the side. He's looking straight ahead because he's looking at an object rotating in front of him. But the video channel is down that is supposed to show the viewers what we're supposed to see. And so we don't actually get to see the object that he has seen. And I would just sum this up as a very terrible, bad, horrible day for NASA doing live feeds. Well, a potentially deadly situation forces one astronaut to cut his spacewalk by more than half a, by more than half after an equipment malfunction in outer space caused him to nearly drown inside of his own suit. It's an incredible story. Trace has more for it. Us on this in Los Angeles. 
Yeah, we all know, Martha, these spacewalks have become kind of routine when you're out there, but the bottom line is every astronaut knows when they step out of that capsule or space station that even the smallest nick in their spacesuit can mean instant death. This was an Italian astronaut. His name is Luca Parmitano, and he was on a six-and-a-half-hour spacewalk. He was about an hour and a half in when he felt water on the back of his hands and then on the back of his head, and the water was increasing. Listen to him now. Try to figure out what the problem is. Play this. I'm thinking that Mickey might not be the water bag. There's no other place for it to come. Unless it's sweat or urine. Yeah, I mean, how much can you sweat? He knew it was definitely increasing over his eyes and then his nose and then his mouth. And in zero gravity, the water just kind of pools like a big blob. And it's not like he can just step back inside the capsule or the station and then pop his helmet off. It took 24 minutes to get him back inside. And then you see there another 11 minutes to get his helmet off. NASA says he could easily have drowned, but he was very calm the entire time. Listen. Uh, did he ever? About a gallon of water actually seeped inside his helmet. Still unclear if it came from his cooling system or from his drinking system, but as you might imagine, Martha NASA wants to figure that out before they send somebody out outside again to have the same thing happen all wow. over again. Scary story. Glad he made out okay. Trace, yeah. thank you very much. So what they can do before they ever go into space is uh, get a chance to put on the suit and go through the tasks that they're going to be asked to do uh, if they are asked to do one. If they're asked to go outside of the spacecraft, they're prepared to do that. They know how to work with the suit. They know the tasks that they're going to be doing. And they've done it 10 to 20 different times in the pool before they ever get sent and asked to do it in space. Uh, for every astronaut in the water, we have two safety divers. We have a float diver, which essentially is a camera diver, videotaping the entire run that the astronauts are in. And then we're going to have two utility divers, which are there to help with tools, uh, to help with the tasks, to help with setup. We're constantly monitoring them. We're checking on them if they need to move throughout the water. And we're there for their safety as well. And which ISO modules in the pool right now? Pretty much the, everything that we have in the pool except for the Russian segment. We have the S0, we have the 1s, we have the 3s, the 4s, the 5s, we have the pallets that kick off of them, we have the labs, we have the nodes, we have the Columbus, we have the gems, we have the gem uh, EBS. I heard that there's also Japanese module simulated? Yes. Uh, in that far corner, we have the Japanese section. It's got the Japanese exposed pallet. The Columbus is the European portion. The lab is kind of the U.S. portion. So it is an international space station, and the Russians have their own section out towards the back. Uh, do, do Russians have their own NBL equivalent? They do. It's a much smaller pool. Uh, it's nowhere near this size, but they do their own training uh, with their own suit. Now, the Russians don't use the same suit that we do. Uh, they use the Orlon, so they train specifically for that over in Star City in Russia. And here's one of them videoing this astronaut. You can see him in the reflection there. Can you see him? There he is, all dressed in black. Can you see now? Oh, if only the reflection was a bit better. Oh, there you go. Now can you see him? Can you see the shadow trooper? Is that really? It's a scuba diver. They're outside the ISS. Here's somebody, probably one of those shadow troopers, inside the ISS. Let's see if you can spot any bubbles. Hmm. But well, there's one inside the ISS. Um, let's see if there, but there's another one inside the ISS. Um, and there's another one outside the ISS. Why is this? It's because the ISS is in a big pool. In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Despite the advanced technologies of multi-layered, computer-generated images, NASA is still unable to remove bubbles in space. Bubbles in space. This summer, get ready for the revelation so unbelievable that only the most observant, perceptive, unbiased will figure it out. Bubbles, bubbles, bubbles 
in space. Bubbles in Space starts today at theaters everywhere. Uh, I definitely haven't mastered it. I'll give you a trial and I'll show you just how bad it is. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. Give me another week. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. Give me another week. I don't know. We're going to have to do something for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I want to do it. I know. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Watch this. I know. Oh, yeah, I can do that. I know. Oh, yeah, I can do that. I know. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Watch Come this. <laughs> Love is just like a man. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. I'm sorry, Jay. No, I'm no, sorry. I, I could see that, how that would affect your Christmas. I made, I made that whole thing up. What? Uh, I'm sorry. I guess I just wanted to seem interesting. I, I guess there's a... There's a real danger of that on this show. But there's a pressure. Uh, well, yeah, guess. people come yeah, out sure. and they just, they've run out of anecdotes, you know, yeah. and, they, and, uh, and they just start making stuff up. Yeah. Like that Neil Armstrong guy. Have you seen him on the talk shows? Neil Armstrong? Do you mean the first man to walk on the moon? Talk about a fish story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> man, and they're buying it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do some research there. Just look up NASA and the Freemasons. Look up uh, the Freemasons in the United States and the Freemasons and the Founding Fathers. <clears throat> You'll be stuck for days. It's, it's, it couldn't be more clear. And they don't even try and hide it, which is what I'm going to show later. They don't care. They just know that 90%, 80% of the world uh, worships NASA and, and worships the Founding Fathers. And, and uh, this is clear that they all had other ideas, other plans. 
um, and they're all kind of coming to fruition right now, so it's a time to pay attention. Uh, this next picture is basically showing you um, the tie-in with the Freemasonic Freemasons and Baphomet, and look at all the original um, astronauts that were Freemasons, and they have this coin that says, you know, our flag's on the moon. Supposedly, they took the Freemasonic flag to the moon for Apollo 11. Obviously, we know that that means they took it to a movie set in Nevada, but still, they made the, Freemas the Freemasons believe that their flag was on the moon. And this picture just shows that clearly. And also, if you look up next to Mr. Kenneth Kleinecht, or however you said his name, see a little symbol on the top of his hat? Go look at the International Space Station and tell me if it reminds you of anything. It is the exact symbol of Baphomet. Same thing. It's everywhere. They don't care. They wear it on their hats. They wear it on their, on their shirts. They all wear the Masonic ring. Look at Buzz Aldrin wearing the ring. It's a joke. It really is just disgusting. They worship Satan out in the open for whatever reason. Who knows? But it's true. And all these scientists and these atheists love NASA. Do they not realize the fact that they're worshiping a devil? If you're so into nothing, everything's natural and nothing is nothing is religious and nothing is spiritual. That's all fake stuff because NASA only worries about science and testing and scientific method and blah, blah, blah. It's not true. Go look at NASA. They obviously believe in something else, but no, you guys will still bow down to them, bow down to your kings and your and your your priestess and your priests and you, you know your holy orders of, of NASA. It's crazy. It's insane. And if you look here, I have the Mason symbol, and look to the next picture there. You'll see easily it is the Jewish star, and if you look down below, it can be converted easily into the pentagram. It's, it can't be more obvious what's going on in this world, and again. Everybody's asleep to the fact that what's going on. Welcome everybody to the Expedition 41-42 Change of Command. So we just wanted to kick it off by saying a few words. And for me personally, this is the most unique ship with the most amazing crew and the most incredible ground support that I've ever worked with. It's been an honor and a privilege to spend 165 days up here. Uh, he went on this and let me introduce a new commander of International Space Station, Captain Wilmar Butch. <laughs> the new commander of International Space Station, Captain Wilmar Butch. <laughs> hey, I want to congratulate you on a great tenure. There is a, a commander of this engineering marvel. Nicely done, guys. And to the whole team here, thanks, guys. It's been a wonderful two months. We're going to miss you guys when we leave tomorrow. And for the team on Earth, it's, it's an amazing, as, as Alex said, it's an amazing accomplishments day in and day out, things that takes place here. You think about all the people literally around the globe working together for the common good of mankind. And uh, I want to make like this. They said, thank everyone as we go forward. And with that, we'll say Equipment 42 has begun. All right? Congrats. All right. Congrats. Congrats. Congratulations. Thanks. Then again, should we even be surprised? In the Strong's Concordance, word number 5375 is NASA, N-A-S-A, or N-A-S-A-H, but the NASA means to lift 
to carry, to take, but if you look at the NASAH, that means in 5377, uh, to beguile, to deceive. And the very first place that shows up in the Bible is Genesis 313, and the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. The word used in Hebrew was nasha. And lastly, if you're into gematria, you might want to take a look at the reverse ordinal system, which is simply A through Z, but the numbers go backwards. If you take the name National Aeronautics and Space Administration, go ahead and put a number to each of those. And when you do, and you add them all up, you get, surprise, 666. Six, six. Jordan Maxwell says it best. So as far as I'm concerned, I've had enough of science. I've had enough of all this doctors and PhDs. I know what's going on here. We've been lied to, and I mean big time.
finally tonight, she's out of this world. The current commander of the International Space Station about to break a big record tonight. Here's ABC's Gio Benitez. They call it the Peggy Factor, Mission Control's code word for the way superstar astronaut Peggy Whitson always gets the job done. I love it up here. Tonight, Commander Whitson making history with her record for any American. By the time she lands in September, her tally will be 666 days in space. Will be 666 days in space. 666 days in space. That creed reaffirmed by those who planted flags from foreign battlefields to the surface of the moon. A creed at the core of every American whose story is not yet written. Yes, we can. Yes, we did. Yes, we can. Thank you. God bless you. May God continue to bless the United States of America.
The year is 1954, and Admiral Richard Byrd has just returned from his latest Antarctic expedition. Enthusiastically, he speaks of an unexplored land, quote, beyond the South Pole, as big as the United States. Calling it the future of the nation, he further touts it as being the most valuable and important place in the world for science, an untouched reservoir of untapped resources, including coal, oil, minerals, and uranium. Now, remember that these are the 1950s, and there are no environmental groups to argue sustainability. The world is the businessman's oyster, and the future is looking very promising. But here's where the twist comes in, because following Admiral Byrd's next mission to Antarctica, after supposedly returning to the United States, nothing happens. No further missions, no talk of any further exploration, nothing. And then a meeting was held between the nations eagerly awaiting to slice Antarctica up like apple pie, with all signatories agreeing to no colonization of Antarctica. In 1959, the Antarctic Treaty was enacted, bearing any independent exploration of Antarctica by the public, with no revisions until the year 2041. Although independent explorers such as Jarl Endehoy have attempted independent access to Antarctica, as they've approached the southern latitude, they've been met by armed ships threatening to open fire on them if they didn't turn around and go back. There are only three entry points to Antarctica sanctioned by the Antarctic Treaty, through which civilians may enter and tour Antarctica, but only under the supervision of pre-planned tours. To date, over 50 nations have signed on to the Antarctic Treaty, which, to this day, remains unbreached. Now, has any other treaty between industrialized nations lasted so long? Furthermore, as rocket science was also a quickly expanding field at the time, it only followed that the authorities seized control over the aeronautic industry before private enterprises were able to venture high enough and disclose the globe deception. With the establishment of NASA, the space program was militarized and all the best and brightest scientists and engineers were then recruited and compartmentalized by this government agency. The lunar missions were aptly named after Apollo, as their prime purpose was to reinforce the heliocentric paradigm in that both the Earth and the Moon are orbs orbiting the Sun. In reality, the rocket launches are merely a spectacle, with all launches curving off and falling back to Earth out of view, and the images they have fed us faked, composited, or downright computer-generated. But the authorities have in fact known what the real map looks like, and they've managed to keep most navigators, astronomers, and the populace unaware behind the globe and celestial sphere, not to mention Mercator's projection. But the United States Geological Survey, or USGS for short, the prime atlas and map makers of the world, have been using a completely different map, the as a muffle equidistant projection, which was developed and proposed thousand years ago by Abu Raihan Biruni, a Persian scholar who believed the earth was flat. But hey, the authorities that shouldn't be love hiding their secrets in plain sight. All other proofs aside, the differences between the globe and the flat Earth become apparent when considering distances south of the equator. After all, haven't navigators, geographers, and map makers mapped these areas? And shouldn't they have noticed this quirk by now, if the Earth is indeed flat? Well, the reality is, the rabbit hole just gets deeper from here. So, to begin. The distance between Sydney, Australia and Nelson, New Zealand on the ball earth 
Given their coordinates and sparing you the spherical trigonometry should be 1,310 miles, but the Australian Handbook Almanac Shippers and Importers Directory states the measured distance as being 1,550 miles, which is a full 18% longer. And while on the Ball Earth model, Antarctica is said to be a continent of ice situated at the bottom of the ball from 78 degrees south latitude, it should therefore not have a perimeter greater than 12,000 miles. However, early explorers like Captain Cook and James Clark Ross, in attempting to circumnavigate Antarctica, took three to four years to do so, and clocked in the distance traveled at 50 to 60,000 miles. That's twice the circumference of the equator. Here's our flat earth with our magnetic center. This is the shoreline that we call Antarctica that surrounds our world. And here's my boat. I put my boat down and immediately the compass points north. If I want to circumnavigate, I want to head west or east, but we're going to go west right now. So I'm heading west and as you see, west keeps turning. So I have to keep going and this is how when you go west, you end up going all the way back to where you started from. Same thing for east. I go east. I keep having to turn because my compass keeps making me turn to go east. If I want to go dead reckon west, so this would be dead reckoning west, if you watch the compass, I'm no longer going west, I'm going south. Any straight line on the flat earth will eventually become south. And that is how you circumnavigate on the flat earth. Nobody can circumnavigate south because when you go south, you keep on going. North, and as I pass North Pole, I'm now going south, even though I'm going in the same straight line.
On the ball earth, several flights would have their shortest, quickest, and straightest path over or around the Antarctic continent. But instead, these flights take all manner of tangential detours, crossing into the northern hemisphere to refuel. One flight that should be a simple 11-hour shot across the Indian Ocean is from Johannesburg, South Africa to Perth, Australia. However, this flight takes a detour north, stopping in either Dubai, Hong Kong or Malaysia to refuel. For a total flight time averaging over 18 hours, this ridiculously wayward detour is frustrating to say the least, but on the flat earth map starts to make sense. Another quick and easy flight, you would think, is from Johannesburg to Santiago, Chile. While an easy 12-hour flight below the Tropic of Capricorn is to be expected, instead every flight crosses the equator to refuel in Senegal, all the way near the Tropic of Cancer, for a total flight time of 19 hours. Though it doesn't make sense on the globe, as you can see it fits perfectly on the flat earth map. A third flight from Johannesburg is to Sao Paulo, Brazil, which should be a direct 10 hour flight across the 25th degree south latitude. But instead, every flight crosses into the north to stop in London to refuel, making the total flight time 24 hours. From Santiago, Chile to Sydney, Australia, a straight 15 hour flight across the South Pacific is expected. Despite refueling options in either New Zealand or any island in the South Pacific, the flight stops all the way at Los Angeles to refuel before continuing south to its destination. As already stated, these detours make no sense on the globe, but are explained and work perfectly well on the flat earth map, having the North Pole at the center. Hey everybody, what's going on? This is ODD. I want to address the insane amount of people that don't seem to understand how fisheye lenses or wide angle lenses work. As a flat earther that makes videos on the subject, I consistently have people send me links to videos where they believe they are seeing the curvature of the earth. But what they are actually seeing is a forced curve due to the lens of the camera. These lenses are called fisheye or wide angle lenses and they come standard on GoPro and TomTom Tom cameras. In fact, all action cameras come standard with these lenses. The definition of a fisheye lens is an ultra-wide angle lens that produces strong visual distortion to create a wide panoramic or hemispherical image. When this lens is arranged sort of uh, straight onto the horizon, it actually is, it doesn't have any weird curvature or distortion. It just looks ultra wide. There might be a little bit of distortion on the edges, but it looks just super wide. Whenever you start to tilt it upwards or downwards, that's where you get the curvature distortion. So if you tilt it, the lens upwards in relationship to the horizon, it's gonna kind of curve up and create a bowl type effect. If you tilt it downward, it's gonna create a sphere or a, a kind of an orb type effect. Besides Hollywood movies and TV shows, these wide-angle camera lenses are the only reason you'll ever witness curvature. It's the very reason why most people believe they have seen curvature. People send me links to endless amounts of videos shot with GoPros. This skydiving video, for instance. False curve. Here's a video from a balloon that was launched by a high school in South Carolina. Doesn't that seem like a bit much to you? Because at 120,000 plus feet, there is no curvature when you use a normal lens that's not distorted whatsoever. Another go-to video for people looking for curvature is the Felix Baumgartner Red Bull Jump from 2012. People really believe that they are seeing a genuine curve here, but it's simply a fisheye lens. Otherwise, New Mexico takes up most of the planet. Wake up, ladies and gentlemen. They say Felix jumped from 126,000 feet, and this is how much curve there is. Doors open, doors engaged. Okay. 
Okay, item 26, move seat to the rear of capsule. Item 27, lift legs. Okay, item 26, move seat to the rear of capsule. Item 27, lift legs. But again, look at footage from 121,000 feet on a camera without distortion, and you'll see the world how it really is. Curveless. What is gravity? We have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs> wow. No, here's the difference. We can describe gravity. Okay. We can say what it does to other things. We can, we can measure it, predict with it. But when you start asking, like, what it is, I, I, I don't know. And finally, this is called gravity. So according to Neil, this is called gravity. But when you ask Neil what gravity is, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what it is, he just knows what it's called, right? So let me ask you this, Neil, what is this called? How come that didn't drop? What's that called? What is this called, Neil? Is that called anti-gravity? Is that what it's called? I'm not gonna ask you if it is anti-gravity because you don't even know what gravity is. Apparently, a super scientist such as yourself and professional actor, you're only qualified to tell us what gravity is called. You're not qualified to tell us what it is. Well, it's just bizarre because snipers have been using the, the, the literal curve of the earth to plan where bullets go. That's if how they you want it plot precise. out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have to when you shoot yeah. at a mile. Yeah. You know, when you're shooting like well out over a thousand yards, those, those factors. So let me think a mile, I have to ask, how much cur curvature of the earth do you get? After a mile, it's an well, you interesting also get drop. question. You get drop and curvature. Well, that'd be gravity drop. Yes. And then curve. Yeah. So both of those. Yeah. yeah. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, bitch. Okay. Hold oh, still now. This is for Obamacare, Guantanamo Bay, the Patriot Act, and a damn ugly dude man. So that's 51.5.
0.1518744 and minus 0.129039 um, bearing to target is uh, uh, north northwest um, average muzzle velocity what the hello sniper rifles are us how can I help you uh yeah hi could you tell me the average muzzle velocity for a SP-40 sure kill? That will be in your ballistic table, sir. No, no, I, I don't have my ballistic tables. Okay, I'll look that up for you. I'm kind of in a hurry here, so don't put me on... Oh, oh shit. Her <sighs> At the Copa, Copa Cabana. The hottest spot north of Havana. Here. Hello, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, hi. The average muzzle velocity is 1,024 feet per second. 1,024 feet per second. Thank you. Is there anything else I can help you with today? No, no, Are I... You sure? Have you seen our new line of novelty fascination tools? We're doing a special on exploding toilet seats. No, uh, exploding toilet seats? Really? How much, uh, no, no, uh, no, it's okay, thank you. Okay, you have a nice day now. 1,024 feet per second. That's perfect. I have you now, Obama. What? Well, Neil, since you don't know what gravity is, allow me to explain what density and buoyancy is. This microphone is more dense than the air in which surrounds it. A lot like the one you are holding, Neil. It's made of plastic, metal components, and the plastic and metal components of this microphone are more heavy than the air in which surrounds it. So therefore, when I drop it, it falls. No gravity, no attraction towards the theoretical center of the Earth. No, no, no. This microphone is more dense than the air in which surrounds it. It won't fall until I pick it up and release it. When I choose to release it, it indeed does fall. Not because of gravity, but because the microphone is more dense than the air than which surrounds it. Now, on the flip side, what causes this to rise? Is this a case of anti-gravity, folks? Oh, no, no, no. This is a case of buoyancy. You see, there's helium inside this balloon. And even when I try to throw it down, it rises. How can the helium in this balloon overcome the force of gravity, which holds trillions of gallons of water stuck to a spinning ball? How can this helium rise? and overpower the balloon. That's because the helium is less dense than the air in which surrounds it. So therefore, because of buoyancy, it rises. Yes, folks, there is no gravity and there is no anti-gravity. There is only density and buoyancy. Here it is once again, folks, density and buoyancy, density. Buoyancy! One, two, three! There you go, folks. If the Earth is 25,000 miles in circumference, there must exist a curvature drop of 8 inches times the mile when you square the mile. One mile means there should be an 8 inch curvature drop. Two miles, 2 times 2 times 8 is 32. That's 32 inch drop. Three miles would be a 72 inch drop. And this would exponentially continue. Here's the longest bridge in the world, the Danyang Kongchong Grand Bridge in China. 102.4 miles long. There should exist nearly 7,000 feet of curvature drop in that bridge. 7,000 foot curvature drop. Do you see it? It ain't there. Look at the horizon, it's flat. You can see in that uh, dive shot that the um, inside camera 
the horizon is completely flat. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to the outside, and you got a huge curve. But when you're looking at some of the amateur balloon footage, some of it's lens corrected, and it's completely uh, flat. And others, uh, like the GoPro stuff, the horizon will fluctuate as the camera spins and tilts. The horizon will go convex and concave, a uh, lens effect. It's obviously not the horizon shifting every two seconds as the camera jumps. Yeah. Uh, and when it's still, you can see all the way up, totally flat. NASA is essentially Hollywood, and all the images that you think you've seen of a spinning ball of Earth uh, are faked. And uh, all the amateur uh, balloon and rocket footage that we've sent up there shows a flat horizon that rises all the way up. And that's impossible on a ball. Humans, for the most part, don't have a clue. They don't want one or need one either. They're happy. They think they have a good bead on things. Uh, but why, why the big secret? People are smart. They can handle it. The person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. Imagine what you know. The horizon, for instance, is always completely flat, and you don't feel any motion. So if you were just born today and looked out, you wouldn't assume that you're standing on a spinning ball. You'd assume that you are on a flat, motionless plane. So to assume that we are on a spinning ball is actually contrary to our common sense and our everyday experience. And there's also experiments that have been done uh, to test whether we're on a spinning ball or not. Uh, my question was, uh, why, why, if, if it's a flat Earth, why couldn't you stand on the coast of California with a telescope and see uh, Japan or Hawaii or something? Uh, and I, I think you know the answer to that. I'll let you, I'll let you answer that. Yep. Uh, you can't see an unlimited distance. The lowest layer is the densest and not transparent. So if you uh, imagine like a hot, humid day, the haze over a road, um, all telescopes will eventually blur out in that same kind of way due to the, uh, the air. So no, you can't see an infinite distance. Is the Earth flat or round? It's round. Okay, now let's see. How do we go about proving that? Go to the uh, seashore. Go to a seashore. Watch a ship sail away. They don't disappear all at once. Now, first, the bottom will disappear. See, the bottom of the ship is gone. Now we can see midway up, and then the whole thing disappears. Now, ships came back. They didn't fall off the table. So people realized that the world is curved. I mean, it's a big curve, but it's curved. So, the process of testing claims, the world is flat, the world is round, is what we call science. Now, if you have a claim that can't be tested, that's what we call pseudoscience. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Boats don't disappear over the curvature of the horizon. Boats disappear due to perspective. All you have to do is go to the beach, watch a boat disappear from your eye, and then whip out your telescope, your binoculars, or your high-powered zoom on your camera, and you can pull the entire boat right back into view. Whole mass and all. Yeah, that's right. You think the boat disappeared? Just whip out your telescope, your binoculars, or your zoom camera. You bring the entire boat back into view, completely debunking everything Koi just told you. And here's my video proof. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Imagine that. You can debunk the curvature of the Earth yourself with just a simple zoom on your camera. Bye-bye, little boat. The flat Earth? Well, that didn't stand up to tests. The round earth did. And you guys, come on. Everybody watches newscasts. You all use mobile phones. 
You all see airplanes fly around. You all go to uh, see Ed Sheeran in concert one day in London, another day in Melbourne, Australia. This all depends on our fundamental idea understanding of the size of the Earth and its shape with extraordinary precision. What the fuck did you just say? The way we teach science is you're just some empty vessel and we pour the science into you and then you regurgitate it on an exam. <laughs> right. Because Earth, we know it spins once a uh, day, yes. Off to a great start. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. Yeah. It gets wider in the middle. And So, Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning. And it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the pole. Not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. Yeah. So, it turns out the pear-shapedness is bigger than the height of Mount Everest above sea level. Well, let me just, so you understand, we've been fed a lie our entire, I want to call it a lie. We've been fed... It's a point of view thing, I think. We've been fed a, we've been, Earth has been misrepresented to us by science. Pear-shaped. Pear-shaped. Science! So they're all trying to figure out, is the universe spinning around us, or are we spinning around the universe? They tell you, they tell you, we don't know shit. We're looking at a bunch of lights in the goddamn sky. You're gonna tell me that that light and that light, that's 250, 100 trillion light years away? How the fuck did you figure that out? And How, you learn, well, don't they have an explanation for that shit? No, exactly. That's what every, what you just said oh. right now. What you just said now is what everyone's uh, natural go? reaction. Because anytime someone says anything about space, you automatically think, Someone figured it out. You don't know the guy's name. You don't know the name of the experiment. You didn't look into it yourself. You just think when someone tells you, how far is the Earth from the sun? They'll say, oh, 93 million miles away. Like you just, right. you, you, you everybody it. relies on someone figured that out and someone double checked it. You're going on what you read. And right now, cosmology, they don't know what the fuck to do. You know what they found out? The What's cosmic out? microwave background shows that all the galaxies are all in, on shelves lined up to us. That we are this. We're at the fucking center. They don't know what to think about. Yeah, there's a lot of controversy going on about it. Well, you should see the stars do all sorts of strange motions, but you don't. You only see them make these perfect circles. That tells me that it's the stars that are moving, not the Earth. The Copernicus principle, the one that we live by, is that uh, we're insignificant, we mean nothing, we're a speck in the universe. That's the heliocentric model that we go around the sun. The geocentric model means that everything goes around us. That's what this is in the Bible, that's what the first astronomers were saying. Uh, um, Ptolemy was the first one to say, yeah, we are the center. You can tell based on these observations, everything's revolving around us. Earth is the center of the universe and we stand still and the universe spins around us. You know what, they've lied so much, NASA's lied so goddamn much that I don't believe shit I, they I see say. They've got that satellite image of uh, that frozen moon. What's that frozen moon? Oh, let me see if that's CGI. Find that fro- They got a picture of a frozen fucking moon? I guarantee you it's CGI. No way they could take a picture. Heliocentric models of Trump. Watches the sunlight shrinks and follows the sun. It's definitely a locally illuminating sun, not far away, not very big, and definitely not 93 million miles away.
just our common sense everyday perception of the earth it is flat as far as we can tell uh, it is motionless as far as we can tell and everything in the sky is revolving around us as far as we can tell if nobody told us otherwise we'd logically assume that the earth was flat motionless with everything in the sky revolving around us and you can prove that this is the case as well for instance with the horizon as you rise up no matter how high you go on the top of mount everest or if you go in a balloon higher and higher we've gotten independent balloons have gone up with cameras the horizon remains flat all the way around and rises to the eye of the camera all the way up totally flat and rises to the eye of the observer so that's one proof now if the earth were a ball no matter how big the horizon is said to be the curvature of the ball if you were to go to nasa it's it's all fraud it's all fake um, pretty much everything nasa puts out is is fraudulent there are no images of earth and from space put an end to this topic once and for all turn the hubble round and show us um earth in real time but they will not do it they can't do it it, it, it can't it doesn't exist literally doesn't exist. Looking at these images of Earth, including the one they call the big blue marble, which is, was released in 2002, I think. Um, zoom into it with Photoshop, you'll see where they've used the clone tool in Photoshop to take a picture of one, one of the clouds and stamp it in various places around the, the picture. They got lazy. Okay, next I'm going to show you um, how uh, a sun that is circling over the Earth, that creates the horizontal aspect of the sun. If you combine that with perspective, which creates the up and down of the sun, the rising and the setting, you get the 23.5 degree tilt that they talk about. It's nothing but perspective. Oh man, and watch how this sun comes at you. Boom. I mean, come on. And that's all perspective. If you look at jet trails, Google images, you'll see them. They start out low at the horizon. They come up overhead. Look at that thing. They come up overhead, and then they go down to the horizon. Perfectly explains what the sun would do. Here it is going overhead. I love time lapse. Look at this. You can't go out and look at the sun. You can't see this stuff, except that it's on, you know, time lapse like this. It's incredible. Now watch this thing. It's sweeping. You know, the sun over flat Earth is doing a big circle, right? Look at this thing. See it sweep into the right. It's like a lefty bowler. Just toss that down the alley and there it goes, hooking into the pocket. Until I found this photo from Grand Mere State Park. This is from Joshua Nowicki. And what you're seeing here is a mirage. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skyline. Very interesting here. Here's what's happening. This is a uh, good example of a superior mirage. So Joshua was on the Lake Michigan shore. He was looking towards the west, and Chicago's beyond the horizon. Should not be able to see it. However, with the right conditions, we have an inversion. We have cold air near the cold lake water and some relatively warmer air above it. This will bend the image of that uh, skyline back towards the viewer. And so typically, we would not be able to see this. This image would be viewable from much, much higher in the sky up in space.
So as you head south, the solid bowl starts to tip onto its side. And um, so that let's say you travel 3,000 miles south of the North Pole, everything would be rising in the northeast, sweeping out over the southern sky and setting in the northwest, like this, right? And if you go all the way to the equator, Polaris would now be sitting on your northern horizon. The solid bowl would be completely tipped on its side, and half of it would be below the horizon. And now all the stars would be coming up east to west. And so the sun would also rise east to west. And now that's a hard one to visualize. Because if the stars are all rotating like a big disk around Polaris in the sky, a big flat disk, or if they're not a disk, they're a big dome, whichever one they are, if that's the case, and, and if it's a big flat disk and it's just a perspective that's bringing the stars down, well then the people in the south say, hey, well the stars should be rotating just above the horizon, right? And stay equidistant to the horizon as they go around counterclockwise. That's what they'd say we should see. But that's not what we should see. We should see a clockwise southern rotation. Why is that? Because the smartest scientists in the entire world all agree that it's real. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Mr. Reynolds, these were all the smartest scientists. Only problem is, they kept being wrong! Well, this is insane, you fool! I'm a fool because I have more faith in the saints that wrote the Bible? Yeah because you just read the words of a bunch of guys that you never met, and you just take it on faith that everything they wrote was true. Mm. And what makes you think what your scientists are writing is any more truer than my saints? Because there are volumes of proven data, numbers, you know, figures. Have you poured through the data yourself, the numbers, the figures? Well, no, I'm, no. Oh, interesting. So let me get this straight, Mr. Reynolds. You get your information from a book written by men you've never met. And you take their words as truth based on a willingness to believe, a desire to accept, a leap of, oof, dare I say it, <laughs> faith? Ah, come on, come on. Look, I mean, I don't even know how I'm supposed to respond to that. Like, ah, come on. I rest my case. Matter tells space how to curve. S space tell, did I get that right? The science community is, is ignoring a lot of the things that we're looking at and so normal people are going out and doing experiments and one of the experiments has turned up um, an amazing fact that we've not been told and it, it destroys the whole idea of this, this uh, heliocentric system um, and that is the moon. Now you can actually measure the temperature of the moonlight next to the, measure, the temperature of the uh, shade of the moonlight and you'll find the moonlight is colder than the shade, the opposite from the sun. So the moon is throwing out its own light and that light is the opposite from the sun. Now that tells you that it's not reflecting the sun's light. Uh -huh. It's producing its own and its light is different from the sun's. So, you know, the scientific community have not told us this, yeah, because they won't tell us this because um, it destroys this idea that the, the sun is, you know, is lighting up the moon. Everyone knows, like, if you're in sunlight, um, it's colder in the shade, right? So if it's 100 degrees right. in the sun, it's 90 degrees in shade. You go to the moonlight, like, you, especially in a full moon, especially if it's high in the sky, the moon is its own independent object. It is not reflecting the sun rays. Uh, the sun is its own object also, you know, the, the um, uh, about the same size, which is, you know, again, coincidentally, you know, why the moon fits so perfectly in front of the sun during uh, an eclipse. We always thought it was coincidence that even though it was 400 miles, 400 times farther away, that it was also exactly 400 times less diameter, which is why it fits. And the other weird thing about the moon, which everyone thinks, oh, it's just a coincidence, is that uh, we never see the other side of it. It's constantly, perfectly rotating, so we only see one side of the moon, exactly one side. It's not like we have like a quarter of a degree every five years or half a degree here and there. It's always the same side. There are no coincidences when it comes to this system. It was, it was deliberately built, but I think it was deliberately built to be detected, and I think we were naturally supposed to figure this thing out uh, maybe as late as the 1970s, but the government figured it out first, and they have been doing, spending a heck of a lot of money. The other question is, well, how come ships don't go off the sea if it's flat? How come ships don't fall off the edge? Well, here's why you don't fall off the edge. There's a 200 to 300 foot high wall. 
that is the border that scripture says is keeping everything in. Nothing's going past that. Because they don't want you finding out what's beyond it. The sailor thinks that he's traveling around the earth this way. When in effect, he's traveling around the earth this way. They began flying it around the world from Abu Dhabi last year with stops in India and China, then across the vast Pacific. Does running around your neighborhood prove that the neighborhood is round? I was an airline pilot for Delta for 26 years. A pilot's primary flight instrument is his artificial horizon, which he has to be maintained level to keep from climbing and descending. From a cockpit, weather permitting, I could see hundreds of miles in all directions, viewing cities connected by roads across the flat plain as far as the eye could see. If a pilot is, uh, is flying around the curve of the Earth, then he it sh it should be dipping the nose down and every, every five minutes he should be dipping the nose down to, to stay around the curve. Mm -hmm. That's absolute proof that a plane flies over a flat surface rather than a curved one. Now, how come in all these ball pictures, man, you can see all the continents pretty much, and there's just a little bit of clouds here and there. Man, it's like some of these pictures, like there's some where they show the Earth at night and you can see all the lights and stuff. It's like, you're telling me the entire continent didn't have clouds? The entire <laughs> fucking continent? Like, you can see Africa and all these lights and all this stuff. Like, you know, if you turn on your porch light, I guess you can see it from space, apparently. And it's like there's no clouds in some of these pictures. And they spelled out the word sex, right, recently, probably a few months ago in one of the clouds. But, you know, if they do their research, they say, well, those are composite. And I said, well, how come they copy and paste the clouds on some of these? And they use the same cloud form. Like, if you're going to make a composite, make a composite, but you shouldn't be copying and pasting clouds. That means you're, you're adding stuff that's not real. Yeah, and the thing is, those pictures that you're talking about, the blue marble pictures, you know, I think it's about maybe eight to ten of them over time that uh, NASA has put out. And you're absolutely right. None of those pictures look the same. The color of the water is different. Like you said, the continents are different sizes. It's just unbelievable. And I think what happened originally was they would put these things out and nobody was paying any attention to it. You know, and then all of a sudden now, people are paying attention to it and now they're pulling these pictures in and it's an obvious fraud. What? And the thing is, there's supposedly tens of thousands of satellites orbiting Earth. We can't get any close-ups of Earth. We can't get a view of Australia with the buildings upside down. And they'll look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> but really, you are the same one for asking real questions. I was taught school book bullshit in public school, and somehow I was able to break free and free my mind. You know how I did it? I watched NASA rockets explode a bunch of times. Fly off sideways and not go to space. If you watch the trajectory of the space shuttle, it doesn't go straight up. It always goes in a curve and out to sea. The point is, they actually go horizontal. The space shuttle goes horizontal. It never goes any further up. It goes horizontal, um, very, very low down in the, in the atmosphere. You know, it's, it's still in the atmosphere while it's uh, horizontal, so it never gets any higher. And it goes out of sight. Not because it goes too high, because it goes too far downrange. And they have a, a plane that's mocked up to look like a space shuttle. Uh, that's uh, it's a jet-powered aircraft. That's it. It's not a glider. It's, it's an aircraft. Um, and that's what they're fooling us. Uh, taking billions of dollars in and giving us 
images and, uh, and, and fake planes um, for that 10 billion, you know, however many billions of dollars it is. What goes up must come down. Um, and literally, we have not ever seen anything that um, has ever gone up and not come down. Hit. If it hit a solid surface, the rocket would have been destroyed, and most likely the camera too, so we wouldn't have the footage, and obviously that's not the case. Kicks and deals. It's a long fly ball going back, back, and the ball shatters the sky, bringing the ocean itself down into the stadium. Oh, Simpson just broke this dream's reality wide open. I know we have still not shattered that highest and hardest glass ceiling, but someday someone will, and hopefully sooner than we might think right now. There's no place to go. Although we weren't able to shatter that highest, hardest glass ceiling this time, thanks to you, it's got about 18 million tracks in it. And it may be hard to see tonight, but we are all standing under a glass ceiling right now. People figured out that we were in an enclosed system. The more advanced we got, it would be the biggest thought on our minds. That's all we care about. You could make a wildlife preserve a thousand miles square. All people, you know, all human beings would do is just be knocking on the fence constantly, going, what, why is this fence here? Who built the fence? Why are we in here? And so on and so on. Why do you think that uh, Truman has never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now? We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. If you start here and you go around long enough in the same direction, you wind up in the place you started from. Yes, Thomas. Why don't we fall off when we walk underneath, Miss Sarah? Because of a force called gravity. What does gravity look like? Gravity is something we can't see. But we know it's a great invisible force that keeps us all here on Earth. It's a natural force that keeps us all from flying off into space. We were always told that the world is flat. You are told right. Don't listen to her. I've been patient with you, Sarah. What knows I've been patient. But now your words have revealed you. Of gravity was discovered by Sir Isaac Newton in 1687. That's almost 200 years ago, Uncle Evan. But there is only one law the law of God. What is gravity? You have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs>
Wow. No, here's the difference. We can describe gravity. Okay. We can say what it does to other things. We can, we can measure it, predict with it. But when you start asking, like, what it is, I, I, I don't know. Einstein, in an Einsteinian answer, we would say gravity is the curvature of space and time. And that and objects will follow the curvature of space-time, and we we interpret that as a force of gravity. That's probably the best answer I can give to a what is gravity question, or why is there gravity. That's the best I can do there. I think that that's a good start. I always ask, and you know, why do they do this? I mean, this is, I mean, other than the obvious profit margin motive, NASA being the biggest black budget black hole in existence, sucking in over thirty billion dollars taxpayer money for the fake moon landings alone. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, hundreds of billions of dollars, and not just NASA, but RASA and all the other fake space organizations around the world giving CGI images for hundreds of billions of dollars. You want to put something in context. If you want to do something with three and a half trillion dollars, you can do whatever. So by surreptitiously indoctrinating us into their scientific materialist sun worship, not only do we lose faith in anything beyond the material, we gain absolute faith in materiality, superficiality, status, selfishness, hedonism, and consumerism. If there's no God and everyone's just an accident, then all that really matters is me, me, me. <laughs> so they've turned Madonna, the mother of God, into a, the material girl living in a material world. It's all about making us feel nothing so that we can be used. If everybody realized how special we all are, how unique every single life is, then this whole world would change overnight. We wouldn't allow ourselves to, to be used by this cabal. I, I start from the supposition that the world is topsy-turvy, that things are all wrong, that the wrong people are in jail and the wrong people are out of jail, that the wrong people are in power, that the wealth is distributed in this country and the world in such a way as not simply to require small reform, but to require a drastic reallocation of wealth. All we have to do is think about the state of the world today and realize that things are all upside down. Now, if you don't think, if you just listen to TV and read scholarly things, you actually begin to think that things are not so bad or that just little things are wrong. But you have to get a little detached and then come back and look at the world, and you are horrified. Now, as soon as you say the topic is civil disobedience, you're saying our problem is civil disobedience. That is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. <laughs> I think our, all our society is run by insane people for insane objects, mm. objectives. Yeah, know, yeah. And I think that's what I sussed when I was 16 and 12, way down the line. But I expressed it differently all through my life. It's the same thing I'm expressing all the time. But now I can put it into that sentence that I think we're being run by maniacs for maniacal mean, uh, ends, you know. If, if anybody can put on paper what our government and the American government, etc., and the Russian, Chinese, what they are actually trying to do, you know, and how, what they think they're doing, mm. I'd be very pleased to know what they think they're doing. I think they're all insane. You know, but I'm liable to be put away as insane for expressing that. Mm. You know, that's what's insane about it. You know what time it is? It's time for us to get our heads out of the sand and wake up. The truth is right in front of our faces and we need to start trusting our own senses and stop trusting fake science and NASA. They have been lying to us our entire lives and it's time to put a stop to it.